up here if any of you back there want them. There's like four. Okay. How are you guys doing? Great. Um, thank you all for coming out and thanks for coming to the Portland Art Museum. Thanks to Celi for having me. Um, it's great that we can all be here together today. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in California so it's so good to see some of you that I haven't seen for a while. I want to start today the way I start an advising session, which is to just take a few moments to get present. So breathe. Let's just all take a few nice full breaths, myself included. Great. Now take a minute to feel your seat and really notice your chair. These chairs are pretty cool. There's like a way that they're all hooked together too so that you don't slide around. But just take a minute to notice your chair. Feel your seat on your chair. Just feel your energy start to descend. Go ahead and close your eyes for a second and just breathe. Feel your feet on the ground. Feel the chair, how it's holding you. The sole purpose of the chair is to support you. It was designed to hold you. You sit on the chair. The chair is sitting on the floor. The floor is supported by the foundation of the building. The building is sitting on the earth. Think about how there's an entire, entire world down there under your feet. There's soil, there are worms and roots and millions of microorganisms. So sitting there in your chair, you're connected to the earth and so many living beings. You're also connected to all the living beings in this room too. See if you can feel the earth supporting you as you sit in your chair. Just take a few breaths and notice. You're never not supported by the earth. So when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. <clears throat> okay, so today I wanna to talk about business as art. I wanna talk about the feminine economy. I wanna talk about how to make more money. And I'm gonna talk about feminist business models. <laughs> Note to myself. Um, in <laughs> In 2003, when I was 25, I opened an art gallery in Portland called Motel, which Celie mentioned. Uh, over the course of five years, I produced over 50 exhibitions and worked with over 100 artists. I was a critical theory major. I didn't come to the gallery with any art history practice, any gallery administration, any business knowledge. I was just this punk kid from Olympia, Washington, who fell in love with art and uh, w believed that you could make the culture, ma make your own culture. So I was driven by this really raw DIY spirit and was very naive to the business of art. Uh, the whole business was this practice in improvisation and innovation. So after five years, I closed the gallery. I sort of felt like I'd painted myself in a corner. The gallery had this very specific focus. And when I was wanting and needing to grow in a new direction, it felt like trying to turn the Titanic around. Um, I was so specific with my vision and the gallery was really tightly branded and there just wasn't room for reinvention. So I learned an important lesson, which is that fluidity and growth are, need to be a constituent for my work, uh, excuse me, need to be a constituent of my work and life for me to be happy. That's New York. <laughs> After I closed the gallery, I moved to New York for what I call the dark year. <laughs> That's actually New York in like 1930, but I was there in 2008. Um, I came back to Portland emotionally and spiritually bankrupt, so I immersed myself in self-help and healing studies. I began work working with an intuitive counselor, this woman named Liliana Barzola Reed, who lives here in Portland. Uh, she was both my teacher and my healer for two years. I don't possess any spectacular clairvoyant abilities, but I learned a lot about how to understand and trust my intuition. So it was also th at this time that I really wanted to come into my own as an artist. Um, I'd worked around artists for a long time. I'd been working as a designer for many years. Uh, but neither of these were about my own art. 
So I decided to take the knowledge I'd acquired through my healing studies and my natural compulsion for giving advice and combine it with this nascent impulse I was having to become an artist. So I created this really casual performance piece called Free Advice. So basically the, the way that performance works, there are two chairs in the gallery, or this day we were sitting outside the gallery, which this is National. Um, you can see me and you can see the chair next to it. So I sit in one chair and the participant sits in the other. Anyone can come, it's just first come, first serve. And uh, anyone can ask me anything they want. And my job is just to be present and to give honest, intuitive feedback. So it's really driven by a deep ethos of experimentation. Sometimes it's conversational, sometimes it's more interactive where we'll do visualizations or lie on the floor and uh, use our body to get grounded. Uh, anything goes. So what was most moving to me about doing this performance multiple times was um, really seeing how courageous people are with being open and vulnerable in public. And that was sort of the challenge of the project. Really quickly, I could see that there are so many people wanting to do good in the world, often they just don't know how. So the most surprising part of the project was no matter what the question, I always had an answer. Or if it didn't come at first, I asked a deeper question and I would eventually get an answer. And that was really a major takeaway for me, uh, connecting with the magic and transformational power of asking a question. So at the time I was doing free advice, I was making running, money running a small web design firm, and all at once everything sort of fell apart, personally and professionally. Three very important people in my life all left in the course of two weeks. And at that same time, I'd been brought on by a creative director to work on a brand strategy project. It was the first time it occurred to me that I didn't have to make or sell something to get paid. I could just get paid to be me and to think. So as I was sitting in this feeling of abandonment, I began to conceive of Armbrust and Company. Armbrust being me and Company being whoever I'm working with. Um, the process of devising the business making the website, writing all the copy, was hugely healing. I wanted to create a space that wouldn't just allow growth, but facilitate it. I wanted to be seen in a new way, and I wanted to value new things in myself, and play with monetizing my natural skills, which I see as connecting, designing, advising, thinking, and offering encouragement and support. So I created a creative, con excuse me, created a creative and consulting studio, which uh, currently encompasses one-on-one -on -one advising, consulting with companies, writing, curation, and conceptual projects. Okay. One thing I learned through the gallery is that the key to a successful art career is a regular studio practice. Um, you can't create inspiration, right? And it's almost like the harder you try, <laughs> the worse it goes. Um, but you can create space for inspiration to come, and that's the function of the studio. So the job of the artist is to show up every day and see what happens. And for me, my business is that space, like the studio. It's where I'm creating a set of conditions and I'm showing up to see what happens. I'm playing with ideas, expressions, and forms. I just happen to be doing it in the form of advising, consulting, business, and conceptual projects. So I'm at, what I'm asking with at Armbrist and Company, I'm asking for people to pay to have an experience with me, for me to be present, to think, to envision, to ask questions, and for us to grow. The deeper question I'm asking is, can I survive as an artist with my creative and personal integrity intact? So let's go deeper into this. Uh, business can function as a creative space, but does that make it art? It came up with some definitions for us to work with today. So what's a business? I think a business is an experiment in, in survival <laughs> involving money and the creative impulse. So you don't need credentials or special expertise to start a business. Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business School, they'll all tell you you need some sort of esoteric knowledge in the form of an MBA. This is a lie. <laughs> so what is art? I think art's the expression of an emotion or idea where something is at stake. So what is business as art? I think business as art is an experiment in survival involving money, expression, and the creative impulse where something is at stake. So what's at stake? Let's find out. Last year I was invited to contribute to a book called Day Job by my friend Taryn sitting here uh, about women in creative work. I've been thinking a lot about money because I was trying to get out of the feast famine cycle of self-employment. And for a few years, I'd been really interested in what my friend Lisa Radin once called femininism, 
By this I don't mean a celebration of all things girly or a sexualization of womanhood. I'm really talking about valuing characteristics such as empathy, receptivity, nurturance, introspection, and gentleness, to name a few. So I've been thinking a lot about feminine principles and wanted to play with the idea of a feminine economy for this piece for day job. So when I think about the ideas of capitalism, it seems to me to be a very masculine economy. So I made this list of what I think the core values of capitalism are. And um, I tried to be as neutral as possible. <laughs> 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 but I, I see the values of capitalism being speed and efficiency, the myth of the meritocracy, profit worship, domination of nature, individualism, scarcity consciousness, the vilification of poverty, materialism, ends justify means, ownership, perpetual consumption, inequitable distribution of wealth, ego, devaluation of labor, competition, and growth. So, I'm glad you guys think that's funny. <laughs> um, if capitalism is an economy that values masculine traits, what could another economy look like? And this is a question I've been grappling with since college, where I studied critical theory. So I wrote a piece called 100 Ways to Make More Money, Proposals for the Feminine Economy. It was simultaneously a manifesto, a question, a healing, a critique of capitalism, and a distillation of all the advice I'd been given that year around work, happiness, and money. So I don't know if you guys can see any of those, but it says, like, uh, let me grab one. 50 is, like, get more houseplants, plant a garden. Number 15, make no assumptions. You know, 52, visualize money as water. 61, pay taxes gladly. If you want this, you can buy it on my website. <laughs> um, what I was trying to do with this piece was create a new vision of wealth and value by offering these provocations under the auspices of how to make more money. And I, I absolutely believe that the things on this list will make you richer, and in some ways, I think that's the same as having more money. So I wrote the piece intuitively without actually sitting down and outlining what I think the feminine economy is. But now looking back on it, I can see the reoccurring themes were resourcefulness, mindfulness, gratitude, integrity, honesty, connecting with nature, and self-care. And since I've written, I've written that piece last year, I took the opportunity to think even deeper on the idea. And um, I think the feminine economy also includes things like asking questions, sustainability, interdependence, vulnerability, embodiment, ease, generosity, collaboration, growth, and abundance consciousness. So, if an economy is a system that determines worth and allocation, what I'm proposing with a feminine economy is a new set of values and a redistribution of money and power based on feminine principles. You guys got that? All right. Good job. Uh, so maybe you're asking why. Why do we need a new economy? Does the one we have work just fine? I would argue no. Am I proposing a conscious capitalism? No again. Some of my clients feel an affinity with conscious capitalism, and that's just great. I think we make good allies. But I'm proposing business as a site to embody new values, create new economies, and experiment with new distributions of power and resources. <laughs> that through iteration, experimentation, and innovation, that is treating business as art, it's possible to wait, find a way out of the dysfunction of where we are now and into something new. So what I started to notice last winter is that women entrepreneurs and executives were seeking me out to help them to devise new business models. Women were coming to me wanting to birth a new way of being in business, one that embodies their values. So what I'm excited right now is, about right now is a new part of my practice that I'm calling advising on feminist business models. I'm gonna take a sip of water. So. My process of advising on feminist business models is pretty much the same as the rest of my advising practice. We ask questions, we make connections, we think together, we clarify, we articulate, we ask more questions, and so on. What makes advising on feminist business models unique is that it is informed by the principles of feminist movements, scholarships, and art. So for our talk today, I've made, made an attempt to identify the core principles of a feminist business which I see as the practical application of the principles of the feminine economy that I identified. 
So these are new ideas I'm playing with, and this is the first time I'm sharing these publicly. So I'm considering this a working draft. So thus, I present to you 12 principles for prototyping a feminist business model. You guys ready? All right, you with me? Yeah. OK, great. Number one, you have a body. Your body does not want to work 60 hours a week. It doesn't want to sit all day. Your body might get sick or pregnant. Your body might want to go to the beach. Your body wants nourishing food and rest and exercise. Create structures that support and nourish your body and all the other bodies you know. Two, you are connected to the earth, the plants, and all living beings. Look at what sustainability really means. I'm not talking about greenwashing or marketing jar jargon. What does sustainability really look like? And what does it require? Like, do we even know? Think about people who make the things that are part of your life and your business. Consider where everything came from and where it will go. Touch the plants, talk to the animals, cultivate a relationship with nature. Think about our shared future. We're in this together. Be human, nurture your relationships, work together, collaborate. Spend time with your friends and family. Be open, vulnerable, and kind. Apologize when needed. Grieve your losses. Practice forgiving yourself and others. Listen, be generous, exhibit care, and work from love. Create agile models. Everything is changing all the time. Devise structures that facilitate growth and adaptability. Be nimble and responsive, stay fluid. This will allow you to stay in present time. Know your core values and make choices that honor your integrity. This is the root of healthy self-esteem. Cultivate your inner authority. Thriving economically while living your values is deeply disruptive to the current social and economic order since our personal values are often in direct conflict with larger social political systems. Many people falsely believe that they must compromise their principles or live under other people's rules in order to survive. Build structures and practices in alignment with your personal honor code. Six, reclaim happiness. This is about making new definitions of success. And this one has the potential to gut you. Because the old you that was created by society and inherited to beliefs must die so you can begin to live life on your own terms. Let go of the life you were told you would, could, or should have and imagine anew. Seven, consider everything and experiment. Don't wait until you know to act. Anything you don't know, you will learn in the process. Improvise, iterate, ask questions, ask more questions. Give yourself permission not to know and to make mistakes. Do we need to do anything about the buzzing, or is it okay? Okay. Um, free yourself from the myth of the meritocracy. There's no earning, there's no deserving, there's no reward. Do it because you love it or don't do it at all. Divest your ego of the need to prove itself through struggle, sacrifice, or hard work. One of my favorite coaching quotes is, would it be all right with me if my life got easier? <laughs> Let it be easy. Tell the truth. This one seems self-evident, but we are being so thoroughly lied to every day that it's an epidemic. Practice radical transparency. Reveal yourself. Stand for what you believe in. Have courage. Repudiate lies, deceptions, and misrepresentations. Hold yourself and others accountable. And use your voice. Money is just another form of energy. It's like water. It wants to flow. It's the way that we exchange resources, get what we need, share what we have. It connects and supports us. When we use money consciously, we begin to see that we are choosing what survives and thrives and what languishes and withers. It's a conduit of energy. Be a conscious steward of money. Use it to support things and ideas you believe in so that they will flourish. Cultivate abundance consciousness. I want you guys to feel, feel how rich you are already. Really, take a second, connect to the present moment, take a breath, and feel how rich you are right now. Know the difference between your needs and wants. 
Trust everything all the time. Connect with nature. Nature is abundance embodied. It's so generative and fertile that it's mind-boggling. I mean, just think of a tree. Think of like the leaves, how many leaves, how many cells. Like, it's um, so abundant. <laughs> uh, scarcity consciousness teaches us gratitude and responsibility. I think we all know that. We all know what it feels like to not have or to want. Just think, uh, excuse me, be grateful and remember that wealth has nothing to do with money. Okay, so and this is sort of the culmination of all of it. A business can be a model for a new social and economic order. The opportunity here is to begin to agitate the current system by experimenting with new models of business that honor our values, our humanity, and the earth. Feminism has long held transformation as a core ideal. A feminist business can model new ways of living, working, and being together. This is about transforming our relationship to money, to work, to the earth, to labor, and to each other. This is about imagining a redistribution of power and resources. It's about social transformation. So what I want to leave you all with today is permission to make the world you want to live in. The revolution is incredible because it's already happening. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.